Cats in the Candy Factory. Will a colour match trap the culprit? The curious case of the missing oars. Can semaphore flags help catch the saboteur? Someone's been illegally catching crabs. But will a boot print pinpoint the perpetrator? And who's been messing with the pasta dough? Telltale leaf patterns trip up the prankster. That's a serious crime. No one messes with my pasta and gets away with it. Absolutely. Oh, did you know someone's been catching crabs down at the lake and getting away with blue murder? But they won't for much longer because Yelena and Charlotte are on the case. Hold on, Charlotte. I'm thirsty. She can't wait to get to art class. We're making plaster of Paris models. Oh, hi, Spencer. Hi, Finley. Oh, you're off upstream to catch tadpoles. Hi, Ariana. Have fun. OK, Charlotte. Hey, you don't think those guys would have been catching crabs? It's illegal. Oh, look. A footprint. One of them has been crabbing. But which one? Looks like a gumboot print. I suppose that rules out Ariana. She was wearing sneakers. But both the boys were wearing gumboots. So they're our suspects. Follow me. I know exactly how to find out which one it was. We'll just get out our art supplies. And some protective gear. Very fetching. We'll start with hairspray. Now, we just spray it over the print to keep the sand in place. And we'll have our crabbing culprit caught in no time. One of the world's weirdest crabs is called the boxing crab. That's because it carries small sea anemones in its tiny claws. And it uses the anemones like gloves to punch at possible predators. OK, now to mix up our plaster of Paris. We're going to use it to make an impression of that gumboot print. We just add water and stir it up so it's nice and smooth. Grab that bit of cardboard and we'll head back to the crime scene. OK, Charlotte. Pop that over the print. Nice. Now I'll pour in the plaster of Paris. That should do it. When we get back from art class, it'll be hard as a rock. OK, let's check our handiwork. Nice and solid. Let's take a look. Perfect. A brilliant impression of our suspect's boot. Now to go find a match. Lots of careless criminals get caught because they leave telltale footprints at a crime scene. If they do, forensic scientists can often match those prints with the suspect's shoes. They coat the tread with a special inky substance, blow off the dust, and press the shoe onto a clear plastic surface. After they peel off the plastic, they're left with a nice clear impression of the tread pattern. Then they compare that print with a similar print taken at the crime scene. Because lots of people wear shoes with identical treads, experts have to look very carefully at the wear patterns on the suspect's shoe to make sure it really matches the print at the crime scene. 
Okay, hand over your shoes, Steve. <laughs> Why? Because I'm about to take a tread pattern that will prove beyond a doubt that you, my friend, are one crooked fellow. <laughs> what? <laughs> so I'm just going to take some paint and brush it onto the sole of your shoe. Shane, I can't believe you think I'm not a straight up and down sort of guy. Then I'm going to press it onto the cardboard. I oh. really am on the level, you know. Yeah, yeah, look at that. Now we can see all sorts of patterns. We've got the curve of the shoe and all the blotches in the heel as well. A tread pattern that absolutely proves that you are crooked. <laughs> so how do you work that out? Well, one of your shoes is off and you can't stand up straight. You're crooked, get it? <laughs> I think it's time to get back to finding someone who really is crooked. We suspect one of our friends was illegally catching crabs. We've taken a gumboot impression at the crime scene and now we need to match it with either Spencer's or Finley's boot. Charlotte's seen them. The boys are catching tadpoles. But which one had been catching crabs first? Let's sneak up and check their boots. You keep watch while I check the tread patterns. What's that? They're coming. Quick, hide. Coast clear yet, Charlotte? Great. Okay, Finley's first. Nah, totally different. I don't think it was Finley, so he's not the suspect we're after. That leaves Spencer. But I better check his purple boots. Ha ha! The patterns are a perfect match. We found our man. It was Spencer who was illegally catching crabs. Nice going, girls. Plaster cast impressions are the perfect solution to taking prints when they're left on material that can crumble or wash away. The plaster is liquid enough to fill all the tiny spaces, but strong enough when it hardens to keep a lasting impression of a suspect's footprint. Hey, Spencer, over here. We've heard you like crabs, so we made you one in art class. That way you'll never have to catch an illegal one again. I think Spencer's crabbing days are well and truly over. Yeah, he'll have to find something else to pop onto his dinner plate. Maybe he could take a few lessons from Stephanie and Jake and learn to make pasta. There's enough pasta here to feed an army. But we still need to make more. We've got a family dinner to prepare for. And we're a big family. Time for another batch. <laughs> Mamma mia! Someone's tampered with the pasta dough. There are leaf patterns all over it. This is not on. No one puts their grubby hands on my pasta. But the leaf patterns are definitely a clue. Let me think. Who in our family is mad about plants? Well, there's Alyssa. And Uncle Antonio. And also Mum. So they're my suspects. Well, pasta prep is officially on hold. We're going to get to the bottom of this. Jake, I need your help. Come on. Did you know that some leaves can walk? Except they aren't really leaves at all. They're insects that camouflage themselves to look like leaves. They do it to fool animals that eat them. Yeah. We need to find samples of our suspect's favourite plants. Alyssa's Playhouse is our first port of call. Hmm, nothing. Ah, but over there... Look, Jake! This is definitely her favourite plant. If we can match this leaf to the impression in the pasta, we'll have found our culprit. 
Now let's check Uncle Antonio's study. Here we are. His prize pot plant. That'll do it. <laughs> and now for one of Mum's favourites. Excellent. Great. We have all our samples. Now for some dough. We'll just roll it out and we'll soon see which leaf pattern fits the crime. Look at these beautiful leaves. See, Steve, they've all got different sorts of veins if you look very carefully. Yeah, they do. Mm, and they're different colours. Yes. But one thing I've never understood is why do leaves change colour? Well, there I can help you. When it's autumn, mm. there's less sunlight, so the green chlorophyll that absorbs sunlight all summer long has a holiday. Oh. And that lets the other colours have their day in the sun. Wow, I'm impressed, Steve. You're quite clever. <laughs> Thank you very much, Shay. <laughs> I only wish I was as smart as Jake and Stephanie. Jake and I were busy making yummy pasta for the whole family. Then I discovered someone tampered with our dough. But who left leaf impressions in it? Alyssa, Uncle Antonio or Mum? We're making imprints with the leaves we collected to see which ones match the impressions left in our pasta dough. Jake's done Mum's. Let's compare that first. No, it's quite different. Not the same shape. And the vein patterns are nothing like it. So Mum's off the hook. She didn't mess with our dough. Now, what about Uncle Antonio's? No, it's rounder on the outside. And the veins branch out in the middle. It's not him either. So he's off the suspect list too. That leaves Alyssa. Let's check hers out. Looks good. The same strong main vein and a very similar shape. I think we found our pasta prankster. It's Alyssa. <laughs> Spot on, detectives. Alyssa was on the way to her playhouse, saw the dough and couldn't resist making a few improvements. And very proud of her work she was too. But her creative crime was exposed because of the distinctive vein patterns of different plant leaves. Veins are actually tubes that transport water and sugary sap all around the leaf so that its tissues stay nice and healthy. Right, we're going to confront Alyssa. She'd better have a good explanation. She's going to be in so much... Oh, shortbread in all shapes and sizes. For us? Bravo, Alyssa. You are very creative. And luckily, we're quite peckish. <laughs> Jed and I have been called in to solve this serious crime. Some of my auntie's top-selling candy is being swapped for cheap imitations. They look just the same, but they don't taste the same. First up, let's inspect the projection line. Wow, look at all this stuff. So this is definitely the genuine candy. But who would have made the switch? There's Lizzie in the office. She's always short of cash. Or maybe Mick, the forklift driver. He could easily switch the goods before loading them onto trucks. Or Ozzy, the warehouse manager. He has lots of mouths to feed. Well, let's bag this genuine one and go look for clues. Ancient Egyptian candy makers guarded their recipes very seriously. It's believed they used honey, figs and dates as ingredients. But the 4,000-year-old recipes have completely disappeared. Anyone in Lizzie's office? Coast is clear. Let's check it out. We're looking for a suspicious stash of candy. Any luck? No, nothing here. She's clean. 
So we'll cross her off the suspect list. That leaves Mick and Ozzy, the warehouse manager. Let's head there first. Wow! This place is enormous. Fake candy could be hidden anywhere. But let's start searching. Hold it, Jed. Look! There's Ozzy now fiddling with some boxes. Phew, he's gone. Hang on. Look here. A box full. But are they real or fakes? Can't tell. We'll bag it. Let's go. Here's Mick's forklift. Aha, uh -huh. a bag of candy. We'll keep this one as evidence. So, that's Ozzy's, and that's Mick's. To the lab. Working out if candies or substances of any kind are fakes or real is a tricky business. But forensic experts can take a suspect liquid and drip it into this column, which is filled with tiny white beads. As the liquid drips through the beads, big molecules travel slowly. Small molecules travel faster. This causes all the colours in the suspect liquid to separate. If the colours separate in a particular way, investigators know whether or not it's the real deal. OK, they look the same colour all the way through. I'm not really sure if they're fakes or not. Well, there's only one way to find out, the taste test. Ah. OK, well, what do you think? Mm, I'm not sure. There's definite flavour coming through, though. Yeah, yeah. No, I can't identify whether they're real or not. Better give me another one. Oh, OK. Yeah, and... Mm. Still not sure. One more. Right. Oh, hang on a minute. I think I know where this is going. Let's head back to Jed and Holly before we lose a whole factory full, shall we? Jed and I are investigating a substitution racket. We've collected candies from our two prime suspects. And now we're going to compare them with the real thing to see who's guilty. OK, now bear with me, Jed. We've got three samples to test and three test tubes. First, I'll add a few drops of water to our genuine candy. Now you stir that up while I add water to our suspect candy. Then we pop in filter papers and the colours in the candy will creep up this absorbent paper. And whichever one doesn't match the genuine candy is the fake. We'll come back when it's finished. Yep, it's worked. Okay, so the colour in our genuine candy has spread out pretty evenly. Now for Ozzy. Wow, it looks very much the same. Agree? So the candy we found in the warehouse is a real thing. Ozzy's in the clear, but what about Mick? Yep, totally different. So it's a fake. Mick, you're busted. Sweet work, guys. Mick was sneaking cheap and nasty candies into boxes and shipping them out of the factory. He was being paid off by Auntie's competitor to ruin her business. But Mick was found out thanks to Holly and Jed's ingenious forensic work. Candy manufacturers use unique dyes and they can be identified because when they're diluted, the dyes are absorbed by paper in a unique way. As a reward for solving the crime, my auntie said <laughs> we could fill all our evidence bags with candies. <laughs> wow, we're like kids in a candy <laughs> store. Hang on, we are kids in a candy <laughs> store. Awesome, this was our best investigation ever. Oh, I think I see a big tummy pain coming on. Hey, I hope those two detectives don't eat too many of those candies. Well, they're the lucky ones. Poor old Yelena and Annette aren't going to get anything to eat. It's lunchtime at their boating class and I think it's a classic case of being up a creek without a paddle.
Ranger Claire's boat safety class was brilliant this morning. I reckon Annette and I are heading for top marks. Just load up the dinghy and we'll go join the boys on the boat for lunch. Yep, looks like it's ready. OK, let's go. Hey, where are the oars? Can't see them anywhere. Someone must have taken them. How on earth are we going to get out to the boat? Yeah, we know. The oars have gone missing. We can't get out there. Oh, this is hopeless. Where are they going now? And what's Annette up to? Yoo-hoo, I'm getting hungry. Two and a half thousand year old Greek ships had 170 pairs of oars. Rowers made up to 50 strokes every minute and reached a top speed of 18 kilometres an hour. Oh, what's that for? What are you doing? Oh, a maritime signal. Nice one. We learned all about that in our course yesterday. <laughs> A cross is the international symbol for help. Hey, guys. Yes, they're acknowledging. They understand. That symbol means affirmative. OK, we're getting somewhere. Now, how do we tell them about the missing oars? Wait a minute. We can make our own signal. Don't worry, I know what I'm doing. This towel and sarong will be perfect. Hmm, but how do we hold them in place? Any ideas? Aha, bulldog clips. Brilliant. There we are. A naval sign that says, we are disabled, communicate with us. If they don't understand that, we're stuck. Wow, those maritime signals are pretty important. You'd better show me how to use those semaphore flags, Shay. OK, Steve, hold a flag in each hand with the red part at the top. OK, like this. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Now, the best thing is to think of your flags as hands on a clock. OK. My head's 12 o'clock and my feet 6 o'clock, right? Sort of. Now, this clock face is divided into eight. Shay? Yes, Steve? Um, which is the big hand and which is the little hand? It doesn't matter. Anyway, we're just going to imagine that there are eight segments and that each of your hands makes a letter of the alphabet. But what? <laughs> Hang on, I thought you said we were making a clock. So what would this time be? Oh, dear. I think it's time we get back to our stranded sailors. <laughs> Someone took the oars from our dinghy, leaving us stranded on the beach. We're trying to get the boys to help us out. And we're using naval signals to get our message across. OK, boys. I'm so hungry. Thank goodness. They understand. Yeah. Finley's holding up the affirmative signal again. So they get it. Lunchtime coming up. Huh? What now? They're pointing. But what at? Any ideas? Ah, they've broken out the semaphore flags. That's the letter R. And that's a C. Ah, C. What's that supposed to mean? Oh, my goodness. Ranger Claire, but where? Huh, a starboard flag. So Ranger Claire is on our starboard side, which means to our right. Come on, Annette. Oh, our oars. And our theory test results. A hundred percent. This was all a setup to test our flag knowledge. Awesome. Now we can row back out for lunch.
Well done, seafarers. The case of the missing oars was more like a puzzle than a crime, and it was all solved thanks to maritime signals and semaphore flags. Naval signals are like languages that allow seagoers to communicate without fancy technology. Well, we passed the theory section with <laughs> flying colours. But as for the practical, I think we need a few more lessons. <laughs> wow, I'm glad that little puzzle was solved or those girls would have totally missed their lunch. <laughs> Shay, what sort of signal is that? Oh, this is my very own international semaphore for saying our final goodbyes. <laughs> okay then, fair enough. We've come to the end of our show, so... Goodbye! <laughs>